Okay, good evening everybody. Um, welcome to the, I think we're going to have nearly 800 members uh, participants tonight who have joined us for, for tonight's webinar and also all, all the viewers who might be watching this as a, as a subsequent podcast. Uh, we just opened up Mental Health Professionals Network which is to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are all located. We wish to pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging for the memories the traditions, the culture and the hopes of all Indigenous Australians. My name is Dr Conrad Sungru. I'm a private general practitioner in Proserpine in, in North Queensland and I'll be your facilitator for tonight's session. Um, we've, we've participated in, in a few of these but this is really a, a very interesting uh, topic for us in that, that this is all about not just the, the, uh, the, the topic and, and the content of, of what we deliver in mental health care but more an exciting initiative on, on how we might actually be able to, to make that better happen. So yeah, we're really glad to, to see uh, all, all that, that part of our business. We're also very, very pleased tonight to have some, uh, some excellent panellists as, as always uh, for, for such an interesting topic. Um, so we're not going to go over the full bio since we're actually a bit bigger than we, we usually are but we welcome tonight Linda Swan from the Department of Health, it's Dr David Walker who's a Rural Generalist from Longreach in Western Queensland, Jacintha Bell who's an Occupational Therapist working in Mental Health Care, Lauren Campbell a Psychologist in Private Practice and Julianne White a Social Worker who also practices a, a lot of uh, mental health care in the telehealth space. So we certainly are having to uh, remember that, that we currently make these sessions happen through the, through the funding of the, uh, the, the Department of Health and we acknowledge and, and thank them for their, their contribution. So we ask everybody just to be mindful of the, the ground rules which we, we have with, uh, with our, our webinar sessions. We really want to make sure that everybody, not only those who are live, but also those who are watching afterwards are able to really get the most out of the, these events. So we just ask that everybody consider the following ground rules. Just remember that even though we're maybe on, on our own and, and isolated from each other, we are in a virtual space, so just be mindful of the, uh, the, the and be respectful of what other panellists and, and participants may be contributing. Remember that you know, we're all trying to, to benefit from this as well as we can. We encourage you to use the open chat uh, tab which you'll find at the, the bottom right hand corner of your screen so you can have the opportunity there to, to uh, include any questions which you might want to, to uh, have us to, to answer. But please try to make sure that you keep those comments brief and, and on topic, that's going to give us the best chance of, of covering through them. And if there actually are any problems that you're having with, uh, with technical assistance, you'll find the technical help down there as well. Uh, if you can't find an answer in that, Dial one eight zero zero two nine one eight six three if you're not able to, to get any joy with that one. So our learning outcomes for this evening's webinar, we'd hope that by able to uh, having a, a talk through all the, these telehealth issues, particularly as they relate to rural and remote patients, this webinar is going to assist participants to outline how these new telehealth measures will provide improved access to psychological services in rural and remote areas. We hope that you'll better be able to recognise appropriate times to utilise these new telehealth measures for rural and remote clients and that you might be able to identify some strategies that you might be able to use in your practice to implement these symptoms to hopefully improve the referrals for clients eligible for these telehealth systems. So we're going to open up with the other perspective from our Department of Health colleagues. So Linda Swan, over to you. Thanks Conrad. Look, I'm here tonight to um, introduce the new telehealth measure to um, improve access to psychological services in rural and remote patients, which commences in about two weeks. I'm just going to provide a really brief description about what's changing. I'm going to summarise patient eligibility for the new items and uh, who can provide advice on who can deliver those new items and then give a little bit of information about where to get more information. So the better access to psychologists, psychiatrists, general practitioners through the Medicare Benefit Schedule, otherwise known as Better Access Initiative, is available to patients with a diagnosed mental disorder uh, who benefit from a structured approach to managing their treatment. It was introduced in 2006 to try and lift the treatment rates for people um, with common disorders like depression and anxiety. It has been really successful and demand continues to grow basically every year. However, 
We do know that a scarcity of mental health professionals in rural and remote areas of Australia means that for some people, um, accessing services requires you know, significant travel time and being away from family or work. Or it means that they can't access services at all. So from the 1st of November, uh, eligible patients are going to be able to access um, allied mental health treatment through video conferencing, uh, making mental health services easier and more convenient. So, It's important to understand that this is really just a new way of accessing um, the services that currently exist. So a lot of the rules and requirements around better access remain the same. There will still be uh, annual limits of 10 individual and 10 group sessions. Um, the rebates for the telehealth items will be the same as the current face-to-face -face items. Um, and Professionals can continue to sort of determine their fees and charge co-payments if required and uh, those sorts of things won't be changing at all. So what is changing? Uh, eligible patients in rural and remote locations can access up to seven individual and seven group sessions per calendar year via video conferencing. Patients can access the balance of their 10 annual sessions face-to-face. Um, -face. The other important thing um, to understand about the measure is that one of the first four consultations must be delivered face-to-face, -face, and that's to facilitate the personal connection and therapeutic relationship between the patient and the practitioner. Uh, we encourage uh, practitioners to really use their clinical judgment as to whether this option is appropriate for their patients. And to understand that for a telehealth consultation to be eligible for the MBS rebate, then it needs to have both an audio and a visual link between the patient and the practitioner. So no sort of telephone calls or, or texting kind of um, services. The Australian government doesn't mandate what technology is used to conduct the consultations um, and encourage practitioners to negotiate that with the patient, ensuring that whatever they use is reliable and secure. And there will be new item numbers introduced for the um, telehealth items that can be used in conjunction with the existing better access face-to-face -face items. So in terms of who's eligible, um, patient el eligibility basically mirrors what uh, is in place now for better access. In addition, patients must be in a rural and remote location. So for this measure, we're using the Monash modified model as the classification system, and patients that live in regions four to seven can access the new telehealth items. The Department of Health does have, oh, sorry, something just, just jumped ahead there. Um, and patients need to be at least 15 kilometers by road from the practitioner at the time of the consultation. Uh, services can't be delivered to patients admitted to hospital or an emergency department. And on that slide you can see there's a link to a page on the department's website where you can go in and just search for your location and see if it is in a Monash modified model 4 to 7 region. So in terms of who can deliver the new services, um, again it basically is um, built on the existing better access uh, initiative, so anyone that can currently deliver a better access service can deliver the new telehealth services. Um, and it, we'll note that additional uh, telehealth items have not been included in the MBS for general practitioners. Um, further guidelines on the measure, including uh, who can deliver it, and, and are available on the Department of Health website. And uh, we'll point out that the Australian Psychological Society is developing resources to support practitioners to consider um, a range of issues, including whether telehealth is the right option for their client, um, and how to deliver services safely and effectively. And those resources will be coming available over the coming weeks. Uh, so we also have a frequently asked question document um, that we've updated and put on our website today. We'll continue to update that as we get questions and feedback. We encourage everyone to go and have a look at the guidelines and the FAQ on the department's website 
And if you have any other comments or questions or feedback, um, happy for you to provide that through the, the feedback tab on the website. So thank you. That input and, uh, and thanks for participating in tonight's session. So it's great to know about these uh, these initiatives and, and the, the technical points that, that go with them. But as clinicians, we need to know how this actually relates to, to what we're doing. So we're going to just briefly recap on, on Warren's story. Hopefully you've all had a chance to, to prove him. You remember that Warren's a 58-year-old male who's been a, 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 a motel operator in a, a, in a rural town for some, some time. He and his wife, uh, 50, Karen, who's 55 years old, they've been working busy there, raising their, their family. But certainly noticing that there's been increased stresses going on uh, lately. He's, uh, Warren's starting to you know, use a bit more alcohol, not, not really sleeping all that well. He's, he's very fatigued, a bit snappy and, and irritable. And uh, so Warren's finally but taken, the, taken the, the suggestion that he should actually come in and, uh, and see the, the, the family GP. So we're going to now hand over to the first of our panellists, Dr David Walker from, um, from Longreach. David, as the, the GP who might be looking after Warren, what would be your uh, input into his care? Yeah, well, thank you, Conrad, and thanks for the chance to um, present tonight, and welcome, everybody. It's, um, it's great to be presenting. Look, I think Warren's case is one that probably most of us can relate to. I find him fascinating in it. And I think most of us would have a patient like this who presents at a point in their life where things aren't really going right. And, and I think the advantage we have as GPs is that we really have the, the longitudinal uh, relationship with patients and the kind of background knowledge of their situation, their family, we might have treated their kids. You know, all those things allow us to, to, to forge ahead from this point in time to, to treat Warren in the best way. I, I think it, it's quite likely that we might have seen warning signs in Warren uh, as we've treated him over the years. Perhaps he's dropped off our radar. Perhaps he's someone who we haven't seen for a while. And the fact that he's presented is actually uh, is actually salient in itself. But I think, as I said, you know, understanding the, the the context in which he works, he's probably very busy. He's working really long hours. His income is probably very seasonal if he's in a tourist area. Um, and, and really, kind of getting an understanding of what makes Warren tick. I think uh, it's also important, in this, if I was in this situation, is to actually exclude organic causes for, for his presentation, make sure there isn't actually anything obvious, any other obvious reason as to why he's presented today and why he's feeling fatigued and lethargic and snappy. Um, and, and really, when I'm faced with this, I really like to, to see the whole person. You know, who, who is Warren? What's, what makes him tick? What's going on in his life, and what are the medical conditions which he faces? From a mental health point of view, I guess if we have excluded organic things, then we're really in a position where to allow him access to the Better Access program, we need, we do need to make a, a mental health diagnosis. You know, we could talk all night about about the validity of different mental health diagnoses, and, and we won't tonight. But but certainly when you give people a diagnosis, you, you have to address concerns about stigma and what his understanding of what getting a, a mental health diagnosis means. And I think that's really important because it helps, um, it really helps with any ongoing therapy for him to know why you're making a judgment and what's going to happen from here. He's going to have a thousand questions going through his head and, and it's our job to start to start addressing those. I really, really try to put away my script pad and, and not jump to the conclusion that everything someone presents with from a mental health point of view needs medication. Um, you know, that, I'm not trying to teach any of us to suck eggs. I think we're, most of us are, are sensible like that these days. But I, I really get to the point where we want to discuss what are his other options. You know, what are the things I can offer him? And in my town, his options are really limited. So what, what else is around? You know, how close are your neighbouring towns? Are there face-to-face -face options that he'd prefer to use? Are there digital options? I'm sure a lot of us are aware that there's lots of, uh, there's lots of digital platforms these days that are both psychologists mediated or not and other forms that people can use. And that really appeals to some people, things that they can do from their own home. Um, and, and the exciting thing that we're discussing tonight is, is, is he eligible and would he be interested in using telehealth to access an allied health practitioner? 
So from a practical point of view, to allow them to get access, we do have to do up a mental health treatment plan and, and the paperwork is the paperwork. Um, I really enjoy kind of talking to the patients about where they see their treatment going, what their goals are, and then do up a referral. The telehealth is very foreign to some people, and I think discussing the practicalities and the logistics of what it might actually entail, you know, with regards to a computer and uh, and having enough bandwidth, I know it's a big issue in rural areas. A lot of my patients have very, very limited data allowances uh, and very limited access to the internet. So I think discussing the practicalities, and it might actually preclude him from doing this in the first place. And then at the point deciding, well, who's the best uh, the best person for that to see, and I put psychologist there, but obviously, as we all know, that might be any allied health practitioner that you think is the right person for your for Warren in this case. I did note, um, and and not to be a negative Nelly, but I did note that general practitioners who do provide focused psychological strategies are exempt from uh, from using this scheme, which I personally think is a shame, but it is it is what it is at the moment. Um, and Medicare rebates aren't available to GPs to sit in on telehealth consults. That's a little bit different to some of them that you might be familiar with. Um, again, I think it would be useful to be able to sit in on telehealth consult to just to help case case coordinate with whoever you're referring them to. So whether that's you know several sessions in, you actually have a catch up on finding out what their uh, or what's going on and what the plan is. The other point that struck me is that uh, certainly in Queensland, the patient travel subsidy scheme doesn't cover patients to travel to see allied health. So it's really important, I think, to check your local rules as to whether the patient will get some patient travel assistance to go and see an allied health practitioner for those visits that aren't, that they need to see face to face. And I think that's my... That's my thoughts on Warren, and unless you uh, have a question no, for me. Fantastic, comment. David. It's always great to, to see that, that uh, very practical approach. And good for all of us to remember that we shouldn't always be jumping to medications at the first line every, every time somebody in distress comes, comes through the door. But you're absolutely right that there are a lot of practical issues that, that go around using this type of uh, care and, and, and this type of uh, initiative. Uh, Jacinta Bell, occupational therapist working in, in a lot of uh, mental health care provision via telehealth, uh, what might you bring to, to Warren's care? Thanks, Conrad. Um, well, first of all, I would I would just want to make sure that um, telehealth was the most appropriate um, way to deliver services to Warren. Um, certainly, he would uh, meet the criteria for the Better Access Program. Um, he's living in a rural area where the closest psychological service is 50 kilometres away. Um, he's concerned about stigma and he's very time limited. Uh, at this stage, with the information we have, there doesn't seem to be any acute risk. Um, and really, I just want to have a discussion with Warren beforehand and, and ask, is he willing to engage and to travel for at least one appointment face-to-face? -face? Uh, from my perspective, I, live, I work and operate from uh, Capital City, uh, so that, that would be something we would need to think about. Um, also, does Warren have access to reliable and affordable technology that's going to be suitable for teleconference? Um, and uh, one thing that's probably a bit less related to tele telehealth, um, but more related to the profession of occupational therapy is that um, being mental health occupational therapy, therapy service, are we the best available mental health provider to meet Warren's needs? Um, and is the GP willing to refer to an occupational therapist who is endorsed to provide focused psychological strategies? Because often I, I find that they're not aware that, not always aware that occupational therapists do provide these services. So next, uh, I really would want to be very concerned about managing risk. It's probably one of the things that's most essential when providing services via telehealth. Um, you have to think about what would happen if uh, Warren expressed suicidal ideation during your video consult or left the consult abruptly or didn't present for the consult at all. Um, my preference would be to have the initial consult um, through a face-to-face -face consultation simply so we can develop the therapeutic relationship. I can con conduct a thorough risk assessment, um, develop a contingency or crisis plan if necessary and then agree to reasonable boundaries for the provision of services. So for example, we might set up a, an agreement that 
Um, if Warren doesn't respond to the video conference, I will call his phone. And if he doesn't answer the phone, I will call his wife's phone. Um, it's really important also to be aware of all the relevant services available in Warren's area. So we can build this into the plan if necessary. So what kind of mental health services are there? Um, would there be access to emergency services like ambulance and um, GP? Uh, as I'm based in the city, um, the initial consult can often be coordinated with other specialist medical appointments or reasons to travel to the city, such as collecting supplies. Uh, so we would do the initial consult face to face. Um, we agree on a treatment plan, a crisis plan and contingencies and I would write back to the GP at that point outlining the details. Uh, that might also warrant a phone call. Um, then we would have subsequent appointments via video conference, at least initially. Um, this is where we need to just keep in mind privacy, um, that we're using a platform that has end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, Warren would need to have a quiet space where he's comfortable to sit for an hour or so and able to talk unencumbered, so with a door that closes and no other people in the room. It's best if the computer is hardwired to the modem rather than on a wireless connection as this can cause a lot of problems. Um, and the clinician would be, need to be set up in the same way. Clinicians will also need to be presented professionally and the environment around you should look professional. So you really need to be in an office sort of environment with good light, um, dressed in appropriate clothing. Um, it's a really good idea to test any technology before the first teleconference to make sure it works properly and also to have a plan of what to do if the internet connection is no good or drops out. So for example, one thing I've done before is turn the sound off on the um, video conference um, over the internet and just had the video via the internet and spoken over the phone when the connection is poor. Um, it's ideal if uh, Warren has access to um, a secure platform for sending documents, uh, a printer and a scanner or a, scan and a scanner or a fax, so that you can send through any worksheets, reading, questionnaires, um, that Warren can do and then send back to you. Um, post tends to be too slow for this to happen in a timely manner. It's difficult to write on a whiteboard or show things on a piece of paper during consultations, so it's much better to send these things through a uh, secure platform before or after the appointment. While engaging via video conference, it really helps to position the webcam and the video of the client at eye level so it looks as though you're making eye contact and talking to Warren during the consultation. And of course, um, using all of your usual active listening skills. Uh, remember that just as you do with your regular clients, to be punctual, um, to let Warren know if you're running late so he's not sitting at the computer waiting for you for a long time. And I prefer it myself to be the person who initiates the teleconference rather than the client initiating it. Um, at the completion of the six sessions, then I would write back to the GP about the progress and or call them and, and offer recommendations. Just from an OT perspective very briefly, um, we would really be looking at enabling occupational participation. So helping Warren to do the things he wants to do and needs to do in his life and overcoming barriers to doing that. And as you can see there listed some of the methods we might go about using to do that such as psychoeducation, motivational interviewing, goal setting, sleep hygiene, activity scheduling, problem solving and stress management. Thank you. Thanks, Jacinta. That's, that's marvellous. And look, you know, it, it seems like a, a lot to, to get through, but really it's, it's you know, having a, a step-by-step -step process like that, that that really can break down a lot of these hurdles that we seem to, to face. Of course, those of us who are logged on tonight are well familiar with the, the use of, of tele, uh, telehealth and, and internet technology, so hopefully we've got a, a little bit of a head start. Warren Campbell, as a private psychologist practicing out of Hamilton in Western Victoria, I'd imagine that you'd have plenty of occasions where you're needing to, to make contact with patients who are coming from, uh, from vast distances. How do you think you might be applying telehealth into the care of a patient like Warren? Thanks, Conrad. Yes, um, because we're fairly isolated in the Western District of Victoria and it's um, you know four hours to Melbourne and six hours to Adelaide, we, we do find that we you know need access to, to other um, technology. Uh, recently a client was uh, referred who lives 200 kilometres away, so she had a 400 
kilometre round trip. So um, with the referral of Warren, for example, the, the via David's um, mental health care plan and Better Health, Better Access Telehealth, we could certainly put that into practice for everyone's benefit if Warren is um, happy to do so. Uh, the initial consultation I would see as being in our um, my consulting rooms, which is, um, is I share with um, four physiotherapists, a podiatrist and um, a dentist. So in fact, if Warren turns up at the uh, office, it's likely to be seeing a physiotherapist really and no one would know. I would encourage his um, support person, his wife Karen, to come, to come because she was the one who observed his characteristics at home and encouraged him to see David and also to be a support person there and, and to drive him home because you know he might not feel um, comfortable then after the consult to drive home. Uh, Reintroduce telehealth as David has already touched on it with or, or um, mentioned it with um, Warren. So to clarify the advantages of using telehealth with him if he is, is happy to do so. With the seven subsequent consultations arranged by telehealth on, on an agreed technology platform with Warren's consent of course, um, that would reduce the stress from the cost of the 100 kilometres round trip each time, and that would have been 10 consultations perhaps, um, reduce his time away from work and increase his perceived uh, confidentiality in a small community. So he wouldn't be having to come to the rooms very often. He wouldn't have to park outside and someone would see him coming um, maybe to see a psychologist. I've established ground rules with him and Jacinta has certainly gone through these in great detail so I'll just whiz through quite quickly. Um, the, he, Warren needs to be aware to commit to the appointment time as if he was coming into the consulting room. So it's not, oh just a minute I've got a phone call coming in or whatever. He would need to come and be present. Um, for him to specify a particular location in the home or office and maybe the home would be better than the office where he will not be interrupted or overheard. Um, check that, that your client or Warren in this case has had experience with Skype or FaceTime which is what I would tend to use and with children of that age, 22, 20 and 18, I'd be surprised if he hadn't used most of those um, platforms. Recently I had a client who hadn't used FaceTime but she was quite keen to have a try and so I suggested she practice with family or friends. Um, I tend to ring the client um, at the specified time almost exactly. The length of the appointment time is still much the same as it would be in the office, it's 50 minutes to one hour. And Jacinta was saying about using um, you know, your listening skills very much so, but also you can actually see a lot from the visuals. You can see if the client is um, anxious, you can, well, hopefully not from just using the, um, the video conferencing, um, but that they look tired, that, you know, things are not going well for them. So it's actually a really good thing to do to use the visuals. As far as the therapeutic process, again, I like to start with psychoeducation and relating the depression anxiety to sleep and sleep is a very big deal. You know, if you don't sleep well, really much of life is, is not good. Um, I tend to use acceptance and commitment therapy a lot and to encourage Warren in this case to accept the situation has occurred and for him to um, figure out what's important, which I know um, that Julianne is going to go into in, in more detail. Uh, I like to get clients to fo focus on positive anchors to divert their negative thoughts, so maybe three positive anchors so he can he can think of those things and you know enjoy his thoughts throughout the day and not just focused on, on the negative. Uh, lots, of, lots of things pop up um, to consider, for example, finances, the effect of Airbnb on his business. Um, right through to does he have any um, past trauma that's of worry to him and he's of the age where 
he can't contain that trauma. A lot of older people, the, the trauma just pops out at them and, and they really have to deal with it at that point. I try to empower Warren as the client to focus on an area that can be changed or improved um, for him to you know, have the choice of what, what to have a look at first and provide feedback to David and the rest of the allied health team if Warren has other workers also working with him, of course, with his permission. So that's me. Thank you. Wonderful, Lauren, and thanks for that. And I, I noticed that although you've mentioned Skype and, and FaceTime as two of the platforms available, some of our other participants are already uh, coming up with suggestions of their own. Um, Zoom and, and VC, I'm, I'm not going to, to pretend that I'm uh, okay with, with all of those, but I, I'm certain that, that there are a lot of appropriate um, platforms available out there. Yes, some of them may require a, a subscription, but I would, I would hope that the, uh, that the assurances regarding security and, and privacy might make that well worthwhile. We're now going to, to move on to the, the, the fourth of our panellists, and uh, we welcome Julianne White. Um, Julianne's a, a social worker practising in mental health, and she's working out of Corowa in, uh, in southern New South Wales. Julianne, I wonder what perspective you might bring to, to Warren's key. Okay, Julianne's just dropped out there for, for the moment. That's okay. So what we might do there is we might actually just revisit that that point, Lauren. So you mentioned some of the, uh, the, the modalities that you use, the acceptance commitment therapy as, as being one, one of those. Um, Lauren, I wonder how, how do you decide about what would be the, the you know, do, do we actually know that um, for all of these practical advantages that the telehealth has got, do we actually know that there's, there's any sort of research that's been done to, to say are these services just as effective as using face-to-face -face consultation? Um, yes, there have been, luckily, some, uh, well, um, our, our good fortune that there have been some Australian studies and Susan Simpson at the University of South Australia seems to be the one who's done most research with a variety of colleagues. She's published three papers in the last few years um, and she indicates, and I think the, her last paper was published in the Australian Psychologist in 2015, um, issue 50, but she said the outcomes of the um, video conferencing are equivalent to face-to-face -face therapies across a range of groups, both using standardised assessment and evidence-based therapies. Um, there appears to be a high level of satisfaction and therapeutic rapport, rapport with clients. So um, yeah, it's, it's very positive feedback um, overall. And as always, with any therapeutic interaction, it is that the strength of that that, uh, that the therapeutic relationship, I guess, which would really make the uh, make the, the, the crux there to it. Um, some of our other questions come, coming through, just talking about the uh, the, the services that, that are available and, and also about the, the billing. We will certainly make sure that we come back and uh, and we might be able to address a, a few of those questions uh, later on. Um, And certainly, yeah, the, the questions about the the, um, the, the rebates, it, all of the, the rebates, as Belinda had mentioned earlier, are, are equivalent to the, the current um, services and the current fees which are which are applicable. Uh, that these aren't a specifically rebated item separate to, to the, the, the types of sessions which you'd be providing already to a patient referred to you under a mental health treatment plan. Mm -hmm. Do we have Julianne available yet? Okay, that's all right. Well, we might just come back up there, David. So we'd, uh, we'd, we'd mentioned previously that David, that uh, for you know for for a lot of providers who a lot of GPs who might not be too familiar with this uh, with this, this modality, um, you know, do we actually have any directories available for how referring GPs might be able to find uh, mental health providers who are using this? Uh, program. When I heard about this, you know, I think a lot of us who work really, and probably in urban areas too, develop kind of tried and true pathways to who we refer people to, not just with regards to mental health, but probably all our specialties. 
Um, but with the advent of these new item numbers, I did look, and, and I noticed that most of the, all of the professional uh, organisations are have now got online directories. Um, to use the psychologists, for example, the Australian Psychological Society, uh, if you Google uh, believeinchange.com, you'll find their website. They, you can look up and try and find a psychologist. Um, I'm not sure how totally inclusive it is, but it's certainly um, a very practical step in the right direction because it, it can be a very time-consuming uh, time process to try to track somebody down. The other alternative would be to, and I use this for, for certain specialties, is to actually task the patient to do some research themselves. Find someone who, you know, you can find a lot about people. Um, a lot of these people have got profiles. Find someone who they think would suit themselves and then refer. So really try to put some of the legwork back onto the patient. Thanks, David. I think we've got Julianne back with us. Uh, Julianne, are you happy to, to comment on, on what perspective you might bring as, as a social worker working in? Yeah, look, thank you so much and thank you for being patient. I'm sorry about all that technical issues. And I'm um, really conscious of what other people have said about the technical part of going into telehealth and also appreciating David's um, contribution as a GP. But as a social worker looking at this, then what I'm going to do is look at some of the therapeutic approaches that people might take. Um, and so we'd actually look at a person and environment approach, actually look at his broader social networking, things that are working well in his life as well as what might not be look at working so well. Perhaps even looking at some of the more general aspects of his family and contacts and supports within his family. As a social worker, we place the person as separate from the problem, looking at the problems that uh, are external to him or internal to him, looking at a biological, a psychological and a sociological uh, assessment for Warren and his family and looking at some of the medical issues like David has mentioned, fatigue, sleep, age, and his knowledge and skills around other, you know, sort of sleep hygiene. Some of his uh, psychological issues around his frustration, particularly grief and loss around perceived um, beliefs that he might have about himself as a businessman and a, uh, a, a person with status in the community. Look at his values, his coping mechanism styles and how he actually uses alcohol and other means to manage his worry like you know, some of his frustration and his moods. Then we'd actually look at his expectations, his finances, his perception of the problems and other people's perception of the problems. Um, and we'll also talk to him about difficulties he might have you know, accessing other support and help within his community. And like the other presenters have said too, I think having a first initial session face to face could be really useful for Warren. Um, just to actually be able to go over what might be the benefits and expectations from him as to what might be delivered from telehealth as well as his face-to-face -face sessions. Because as you know, sort of um, Jacinta and Belinda have both mentioned, there's quite a few difficulties in rural communities providing really good, effective and timely telehealth um, services to people. So I think it's really good to have some really good structured um, approaches to what we could offer Warren. Really mindful too that he's very time poor and really putting, you know, the part of his problem is putting time into his business so we don't want to actually add to the burden any further. And I think when we're actually offering telehealth, we need to be really mindful of those micro skills that we use because we don't have those other cues that we've got when we're sitting opposite a person. So very mindful of paraphrasing, summarising and also looking at facial expressions. And I love the way that Jacinda talked about, you know, where do you hold your eyes when you're looking at a camera? so that the client really feels that they are listened to and I think that's absolutely critical in providing continuity of therapy between face-to-face -face and telehealth. So going back into some more of the therapy approaches, you know, really looking at the hierarchy of the problem for him, but quite a few out there, you know, with his frustrations, his schemas, his beliefs, and you know, and actually really try and help him unpack how he's tried to fix the problem in the past. He's a really clever man and I think we've got to really acknowledge his strengths and his skills that he's had in the past. I'm just going to do something here technical uh, to unmute that. And then also to use his family member um, and look at other systems involved in his life. Got to start with some short-term goals. I think it's really achievable for him, very mindful of the time that he wants to spend on actually looking at solutions. Really mindful too that you know a lot of his frustrations in his use of alcohol and perhaps sleeplessness might be due to some uh, approaches around grief and the grief that he might be experiencing about his perception of himself, his role, his relationships. Um, acknowledging too that grief is not just about death and dying, grief is very much about a neurological, a biological and a psychological reaction to any significant change where we have a perception of one of loss. 
which is either primary, which is the loss event, secondary, which are things related to it, or tertiary, more broader issues that could infect a person. We also need to understand schemas and how they've informed Warren's attempt to find solution and inform his values around his life. And understanding that schemas is, is a mental structure that people have to organise their world around them, how they make sense of you know, Warren from his business perspective, how successful he expected to be in his life, you know, how he expected to be able to manage things and be able to hold his face up in the community and be successful in various parts, and how he should, or perhaps had an expectation that he should cope with stress. What I've got up here is just a diagram of the schema activation formulation, which when I had a face-to-face -face with Warren, or even if it's something that could be emailed him, so that you could sit down with him, actually work through various aspects of the other thoughts or emotions, behaviours, and what how, how some of his schemas or his core beliefs and um, feelings that he might have about himself and what might be some significant triggering events. This other diagram that I've included here is to actually look at the dual processing model of grief, which is really useful when we're looking at grief from a non-death or even from a death perspective, but working with Warren to actually look at what might be significant triggers that are taking him from focusing on his losses that, as he perceives them to actually looking at how he's adapting and how he's actually focusing on life's changes and how he can make sense of what's going on in his world and actually find what could be triggers now, but also preparing him in the future for other triggers. And I think this one I've you know, had to perhaps offer here to this is just um, perhaps a therapeutic approach to add on to what Lauren and Jacinta and David have also added to this scenario for, for Warren and his family. So thank you, Conrad and, um, and others. So uh, that's my perspective. Oh, wonderful, Julianne. And uh, well, actually, that, that brings us to, to the, the Q and A uh, part of the, the, the evening. And actually, I'm, I'm going to return to, to you, Julianne, but before yeah. we before we leave, leave you again, um, we, we've already mentioned that that as this initiative requires both telehealth and, and face to face deliveries, and as you've said, it's great to be able to get that first face to face consultation with the client right. to really get that engagement in, in place. How would you decide then on, on which aspects of the therapy you'd allocate to each of the, each of those modalities, face-to-face -face or telehealth? Um, Connor, that's a really good question because I think sometimes that's about that art of the clinical, the clinical skill in trying to assess perhaps where Warren might be. But I think from a general rule of thumb, it might be that a lot of the more educative and um, practical aspects of therapy can be really quite easily delivered on telehealth and some of the more deeply personal or where you really want to engage with some, you know, where you need that eye contact or face to face with the person to um, unpack just what some of their reactions or some of the problems or new issues that might have come up over the time between each session might be more easily done in a face-to-face. -face. And I'd actually suggest that to Warren early in saying there'll be times when things might be tricky or difficult, he might feel a little bit um, that he's not coping with other things or new things have happened and we need to re and not have something set in cement but know that we can actually re-engage with the face-to-face -face if that's what he feels is uh, more beneficial at the time but that we'd actually try and structure that more educative stuff was done over the telehealth and the more engaging face-to-face -face stuff uh, around personal you know, issues that you might want to unpack. Great, great to see. Jacinta, we might move on to, to you with, the, with the, the next question there. Um, as you mentioned in, in your presentation, that sort of having a, a plan in place about risk and, and what might happen with, the, uh, with being able to go through that discussion with your, your client early in the, the picture really is so important. What might be some of the simple strategies you might suggest to our participants to help de-escalate the stress of, a, of an agitated or at-risk patient during a telehealth consultation? Yeah, thanks, Conrad. That's a really important question. Um, in the in the absence of uh, the first thing we tend to do when we're face to face with people, and they're and they're struggling, is um, is to offer tissues, a glass of water, um, and it uh, it's not something we can do in a telehealth consult. So so quite often I'll coach people in gathering those items, doing a little bit of self care themselves. Grab, grab me. Have you got a tissue close by? Um, would you like to get yourself a drink of water? Um, and then the next stage might be to guide them through a simple um, breathing strategy or grounding technique, um, such as getting them to describe all the objects around the room, just to get just to get calm. Um, if 
that's not working, we might enlist a family member or somebody close by to provide some support if they're present. Um, and it, we might develop a plan of action for what they're going to do following the video conference for themselves. Um, if it develops into a, a serious emergency, um, we would stay on the conference. Um, I would look to be calling an emergency service. Um, and some of the little things that will be important to, um, think, to think about is if the client's at home by themselves, Warren's at home by himself, then getting him to unlock the front door um, to allow access. Um, and other things, that sorts of things we've done before is, is getting people to throw self-harm implements in the garden that, so that they're out of reach, that type of thing. So that's getting quite extreme, but those are the sorts of things that are, are good to have in your back pocket when you need them. Thanks, Conrad. Thanks, Jacinta. Um, amongst our, our participants tonight, there's a few questions. Kerry's actually raised the, the point about this might be a better way to help with the, the maldistribution of psychologist services across Australia. I guess it's easy for all of us to, to think about, we're talking about rural psychologists, and certainly our panellists tonight have predominantly been from rural areas, but as you see with Jacinta, that we, we may actually also have uh, health professionals working with social and emotional wellbeing for, for patients who, although they might be based in, in metropolitan areas, certainly are capable and, and able to, to provide outreach services. And uh, we have had the, the mention already of what happens with fly-in, fly-out workers. Uh, who might be based in the city, but when they're actually away on shift or, or out on, on their, their roster, uh, although they might be actually geographically very distant from their, their usual uh, mental health professional, that this might be a way of, of being able to provide continuity of services. Uh, unfortunately, we're not able to, to address all the questions about private billing arrangements. Uh, those are certainly something which you'd need to, to, uh, to discuss together with, with your clients as your own circumstances uh, evolve. But uh, we're certainly talking about the Medicare-funded uh, rebates that are available under the uh, under the, the mental health treatment plan. <coughs> we might actually then just re return to, to you, uh, Belinda. Uh, some of the other patients have, some of the other participants have been asking about eligibility for uh, for other groups of, of patients. We're, we're, we've got talking about uh, children or or clients under 18, but also eligibility for, for group sessions as well. What sort of flexibility around these arrangements are there for <coughs> professionals, Linda? No, that's a great question. So um, the new telehealth items have been structured around the existing better access items. So there's no age limit in terms of um, services to children. Um, it's really just uh, yeah, whether or not um, it's a clinically appropriate, um, whether the practitioner determines it's clinically appropriate to do that service with a child over the phone, over video conferencing. Uh, and these items are definitely available for group um, sessions. And again, the practitioner needs to think about um, how best to to run that with the group and think through sort of the the clinical and the technical issues, but. There's no um, restriction on group sessions under the telehealth items. Sure, thanks, thanks for that. It's also great to see some of the, the points coming through about the, the importance of uh, being able to, to use those, still those non-verbal uh, verbal techniques. Uh, Jacinta and, and Julianne were both mentioning about all of those other practicalities of, of the, even if you're based on, a, on an internet connection, Still being able to pick up on uh, on eye contact and, and voice and, and everything, and you know yourselves as, as professionals will we'll all be, be aware that it is particularly important when you're not in the room to, to make sure that you've uh, that you've got that that in place. Uh, some other participants have also been talking about the the applicability of this for people who might not engage well with face to face consultations, particularly for patients who <coughs> suffer from severe anxiety. Uh, that, that that that's a great point, but we'd have to remember that. For those uh, for those consultations, they're, they're still uh, un bound by that that same guideline of needing to be 15 kilometres away from the from the, the treating therapist for, for eligibility. But it's great to, to already see a little bit of creativity and uh, imagination coming into the, uh, the the way that participants are thinking that they might be able to apply this into their into their own settings. Um, it's also interesting to, to see some of the comments regarding. What happens with uh, Apple versus Mac, or, or sorry, Apple versus versus PC? Um, look, yeah, I don't know what all of the options are for for Apple if uh, if FaceTime's not uh, HP AAA compliance, but 
uh, you can certainly still be being able to, to download uh, the, the apps when, when appropriate. So we might uh, we might take this opportunity to uh, to sort of you know recap a, a little bit on uh, on what sort of ways we we, uh, we we each think that we might be able to, to sum up the, the, the key points for uh, for each of our participants in, into Warren's care. Um, David, what do you think might might change for you in in the way that uh, that you'd be be better able in, in the future to, to look after somebody like Warren? Yeah, thanks, Conrad. Look, I think um, I, I think the key thing about this is it just provides an extra string in my bow of things I can do for all my patients, and and you know it's about finding the right uh, the right modality for each patient and to allow access for rural patients to see a psychologist and to help kind of bridge that um, that gap, so to speak, that exists and the, the lack of access is something that I think is really important. So I think I think for um, for Warren, this will and this will give me a chance to open up to all sorts of other practitioners. You know, in my local town, we uh, occasionally have a psychologist visit, but now I can explore other options and uh, amongst other allied health practitioners, just about anywhere in Australia. So I think to be able to um, to be able to tap into that resource, especially with regards to people with particular interests, I can now try and find a, a practitioner who's got a particular interest in what my patient has, and I, I think that's fantastic. Very, very good, good point there, David. That yeah, you know, we, we don't have to be constrained by that that traditional geographical um, distribution of, of the, the, the the best professional for the, the job. If we if we've uh, been to a workshop and we've met somebody fantastic in a metropolitan area, uh, even though we ourselves might be in, in a rural practice, if the, the patient is willing to still to go and have uh, a few face to face consultations with them. This really is going to provide a great way to, to provide ongoing care for, for those, those patients. Um, just in that, you know, you're, you're based in, in a metropolitan area. Uh, how are you finding that this type of uh, initiative might be changing the way that you can deliver care? Uh, sure, yeah. Look, uh, we already do um, provide a fair bit of telehealth. Um, obviously, it's not, it's not under Medicare. Um, but but West Australia is a huge state, um, and and there are a lot of people living in those rural and remote areas. Uh, we find that a lot of the time they they need to travel to Perth for uh, consults with specialists, um, pain specialists or psychiatrists or whoever it is that they might be needing to see, um, and and that is where the referrals often come from for us to see people and. They, they then, we will then talk to them about their options and quite often people will choose, even without a Medicare rebate, to, to have a, a telehealth consult um, simply because it makes it, um, it makes it much easier for them to access the service. Um, but with the Medicare rebates available, this will just make it so much more affordable for people in rural areas to access uh, quality health services. That's, Thanks, that's what I think. That's all right. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. Mm. Um, Philip's raised the, the, the interesting point there that uh, when you know, we, we've, it, it takes a, a few sessions, obviously, to, to be able to really build up a, a therapeutic rapport with, with a, a patient, and we might find that it's, you know, it, it's taking first three sessions really to, to notice that there's, there's something there. Um, Philip, we, we would certainly still be, be hoping that uh, that you know, just as we do current reviews for, for mental health treatment plans, that we'd be able to send a, an update referral back to the uh, back to the, the, the uh, referring GP uh, to, to say, look, you know, we, we'd want to we'd want to be able to access further uh, further access for these, these patients. Belinda, you know, we've, we've mentioned already that the requirements for uh, for patients to be receiving face-to-face -face and uh, telehealth consultations under under this initiative. But the the comment has, has come up on uh, a few participants about what happens when the, the travel is is prohibitive. Um, do we do we have any flexibility with that, or uh, is it really up to the GP and the patient and the mental health professional? to decide about where that distribution of services is going to be? Yeah, so there isn't the flexibility to um, extend 
telehealth to all 10 uh, better access services. The, the rules around what are the first four sessions being face-to-face, -face, um, we're not able to, to offer extension, uh, exemptions to that rule. So it is up to the practitioner and the patient to sort of think about um, how they might access those face-to-face those -face services. Right. Okay. Yeah, thank, thanks, Linda. And I, I noticed that although we've got some participants who are logging in from overseas tonight, we, I don't think we can actually apply the, uh, the, the utilisation of these item numbers to overseas professionals. We are only talking about uh, mental health providers uh, registered with, with APRA uh, and eligible for, for Medicare rebates in Australia. So now we can't start referring people to, to Germany or, or to Texas, even though some of our participants might be, might be overseas. Um, Lauren, we've, uh, we've mentioned already about some of the, the, the modalities which, which would be appropriate for, for use of, uh, for, for these, these patients and you've certainly known the ones which, uh, which work best for, for you. How, how might you find that you uh, are better able to, to utilise these, these initiatives in, in your practice? Well, um, the, the distances aren't as great here as they are in Western Australia, so to have people actually come into the office, mind you, 400 kilometres for that one lady recently was a, a long way, but generally it would be about, you know, similar to Warren, so it would be about 50 kilometres or, or um, 100 maybe. Um, so I think... Um, yes, that would enable us to use a combination and, and sometimes it's with clients you have already seen for some time as well. You know, I'm thinking of, of people I've seen in the past and, and seen through private health cover and I've seen them for quite a period of time face to face and then uh, one chap has got a job that takes him over half the state so he's, he's often in his car driving around um, and from that point of view the, the telehealth initiative would be very good for him in that we could, we could access each other no, no matter where he was really. Um, so I think that, that would be a great benefit. Um, so yes, the combination of face-to-face -face and, and telehealth would work well for me. Uh, with the, some of the other results from the studies, it indicates that social anxiety, uh, people with social anxiety really appreciate being able to use the telehealth health initiative or process. Um, so I guess we need to be mindful that that's sort of keying into their avoidance of situations, but also, you know, we still need them to have their exposure sessions and so forth, just because they're not coming into the office, which would make them extremely stressed. Um, we do need to set the homework for them to do as well. Um, the other thing that was mentioned in the studies was it reduces the no-shows that, um, you know, people don't come sometimes because they haven't got the petrol or their car breaks down or, um, you know, haven't been paid or whatever, so they can't afford to travel in their car and so they will still accept um, a call, a conference call. So I think that that was quite interesting as an outcome. Mm, okay. Uh, one of our participants, Josh, was a, a bit concerned that we were overlooking uh, the, the the difficulties that some of our patients have in, in accessing face-to-face -face consultations. And uh, uh, Josh, I, I, I guess that means that you're hoping that we'd be able to deliver all of these uh, the, these uh, consultations through telehealth. Um, I, I think we've actually covered quite well there that the importance of, of using that, that initial in, in, uh, consultation, if, if available, to actually build up that, that personal therapeutic relationship, really get a, a, proper, uh, a proper assessment of the, of the client there in front of you and then hopefully be able to, to build on the, uh, on the, the progress of that, that first session with, with some subsequent telehealth visits. Um, yes, we acknowledge that certainly that there are still uh, barriers that, that, that occur. This is a, a big country and it is difficult for, for, uh, for, for clients, but we'd hope that sometimes that the face-to-face the -face might be two ways as well, that there might be occasions where if you actually do start to, to notice that you're developing a number of rural or, or remote or, or regional clients, that uh, it might occasionally be worthwhile you coming out to, to those areas and, and maybe being able to access the, the group visits or being able to, to schedule a few uh, a few 
face-to-face attendances for, for one visit out to the, to the rural area and really be able to, to actually see the, the environments that your, your clients are, are living in. But we, we most certainly do acknowledge that it can be difficult for our, our clients to, to come into the metropolitan areas and uh, that's why David certainly pointed out in, in the early stages that it really is, is important to find out what are the, the travel subsidy schemes which are available in, in, in your state because all of the uh, all of the, the different state health departments do have general uh, guidelines regarding the, the provision of those of those services. And uh, Julianne, we might just move finally back back to you then on on, on how you see that this uh, that these, these initiatives might help you with, with opening up a, an area of practice in your work. Look, I think it's been you know really well covered with. Um, with Lauren and Jacinta and David as well, talking about how wonderful it is to actually add it as a suite of options we can to our clients. And I think, you know, looking at that tyranny of distance is really good. I also think through enabling or enforcing that we're still going to have some face-to-face -face means that, you know, we, we still have to try and find fairly local people, you know, people within the one to 200 kilometres. We're not always going to go to someone, you know, if we're in, like where I am in the Riverina and thinking that, well, you know, I'm not going to use anybody locally. Um, I'm going to go outside completely outside the area. I think those safeguards about having you know, the, maybe the face-to-face -face sessions are a safeguard to still think local and not think of always got to go for rural people to metropolitan areas. Um, I think from my practice as a social worker here that um, we offer a specialised type of service around grief and trauma that um, it enables clinicians to choose perhaps people who've got a specialisation or like David's point is actually tailoring or finding the right clinician for the right client because um, sometimes you don't have the right service in your area so I'm quite excited about the initiative Conrad um, and I welcome the department's initiative on this. Mm. Uh, and, and certainly as we're going, we've, we've got a, a lot of participants obviously online with us tonight who have all got special areas of, of interest and I guess that as, a, as a GP working in rural area myself and, and David will be in the same regard that we don't always know that. So it, it's so important that when, uh, when directories such as that uh, provided by APS uh, are coming out that they really do give us as, as the, the isolated clinicians an idea of what those particular interests are, so that if we do have somebody who we're wanting to talk about grief or trauma, uh, trauma-related uh, illness, uh, that we really know who is the, the best one to be going with that. And, and certainly making sure that when you, you do update your details, uh, that you do have your, your, um, your contacts uh, up to date. So obviously we're seeing that what is your preferred platform uh, and what might be the, the requirements that you have for um, for usernames and, and for downloads and all those, those types of areas as well. So, look, I, I certainly share the enthusiasm of our, of our panellists. Uh, I know uh, certainly that, that in this area we, we struggle with uh, with access to, to mental health professionals and, and to know that we've got that diversity of, of, um, of services available because it is, it's one thing for, for a, a patient to be able to get down to, to one or two visits in, in a major area, but when you're talking about sort of you know five or six, it, it can really become quite difficult. So I, I know that this will certainly be that the way that, that we uh, that we move into into the future. And uh, into some of the other uh, panelists, uh, sorry, the, the participants. Yes, I think this is first of November is when this initiative rolls out. Is that correct, Belinda? Yes, it is. So um, two weeks and a day away, I think. <laughs> Well, bring it on, bring it on. That's, that's great. All right. So, well, as we, as we wrap up, then we uh, we certainly thank all of our um, all of our, our panelists and our, our participants for their um, for their participation tonight. Um, we've got the you'll see the the, uh, the resources link down at the, the bottom of the, of the screen there. Uh, and not only is that um, that fantastic for tonight, but There'll be a lot there to the Department of Health guidelines and also those frequently asked questions which you've been coming up with. And rest assured that even if we haven't been able to, to cover your, uh, your, your particular comments tonight, that the Department of Health will be holding on to, to those so that they can actually make sure that as they do their revisions of this, this initiative and work on refining it for the future, that we can make sure that it is pertinent and, and remains contemporary because obviously there's only so much that, face, that, that fo focus groups can provide when you actually get real clinician experience as they've had tonight. It's invaluable for them to have all of these perspectives. So thank you everybody else for your, uh, for your, your concise and, and respectful comments as we've, as we've gone. 
So we're uh, we're now going to uh, to to wrap up on on this one. I, I hope that you've uh, you've enjoyed the enjoyed the, the, the session and uh, and that you've you've got something out of it. We uh, we invite everybody to to register for the upcoming uh, upcoming uh, MHPN webinars. It's going to be on internet gaming addiction and the effects of mental health. On that's coming up in uh, in a few weeks on Wednesday, the twenty second of, of November. We also ask everybody to please make sure that you complete the, uh, the, the feedback survey, which is going to be clicking up for you. Uh, it, it really is through the, uh, through the, the, the use of those, those feedbacks that we really are able to, to guide with which way these, these sessions go and, and make sure that they're the most valuable for you. Um, and if that, if that doesn't actually get, come up, you can, you can certainly just click on, on the tab at the, the bottom of the screen. Uh, if we've got your current email address, you'll be receiving your certificate of attendance for, for tonight's session, uh, but within the next four weeks. And, uh, and you'll also at that stage receive the, the link to any of the resources mentioned in the, the resource library there, there tonight. So uh, we, we'd hope that you've, uh, you've, you've enjoyed your, your uh, experience with Mental Health Professionals Network. We'd uh, encourage you all to increase your, your involvement and, and uh, please consider signing up. Uh, as, a, as a facilitator in your, your local area as, as well. But um, but no, with, uh, with, with that, I think that we'll be uh, happy to, to acknowledge that um, we, we always make sure that we, we, you know, we are always mindful of the, the support and engagement of those local networks that we've, that we've got. Um, we know that being able to have these these inputs from from different um, modalities of, of treatment really do make such a such a difference to outcomes for for our uh, mental health pa patients. And we, we would like to see all of you um, to consider whether you might be able to increase your your participation in these uh, these networks as we go. So we are just going to, to finish with acknowledging the consumers and the carers who live with mental illness in the past and those who are continuing to live with mental illness in the present. On behalf of the, the panellists and the Mental Health Professionals Network, thank you very much everybody for your participation this evening and good night. <laughs>